was being picked up in there. I wasn't sure. How's everybody doing? It is good to be here. Like, like I said, last week I was not here unexpectedly. I had to uh, take off. A lot has happened. It is good. Um, this is not so much my story to share, but I know many of us know this. So I'm gonna share. I, I was taking my firstborn son to a treatment program down in Nashville. He decided he wanted help, and I left everything to go help him. That's good news. Pray um, that all goes well. Um, and he continues to work the program and to find health. Our God is a redeemer. Our God is a way maker. And I think that's important for us to remember always. Um, and especially for us to hold on to when things get hard. Uh, but a lot, we, we covered, uh, right before I left, we had a few meetings, staff and uh, consistory meetings, and a lot. I just want to briefly update you on, and we're going to talk more about all these things. Good news, Coffee Corner's coming back. Coffee Corner, for those of you who, you know, don't remember the world before COVID, was when we had food and coffee and we community. We need community. We were actually talking about, one of the conversations we were talking about uh, was do we bring back just a few like eight weeks of discipleship classes in the spring because of course you know we all know what happens in Bismarck in the summer everybody leaves right we know that so we don't do that but we could do an eight-week discipleship class or and what what kind of rose to the surface was we don't need content and classes what we need is each other there's been a lot of isolation a lot of separation and so we're gonna um March 14th is the day we put on the calendar. We're going to have coffee in the commons. Now, if you want to have a class and you want to gather with a group of people and study something, it's a big building, right? That's fine. But um, mainly we want to see people just getting together, sitting around the table, drinking coffee, eating something, and being together. That's really important. In the meantime, we're driving all of our efforts and all of our focus, right, on something that we're going to call Redemption Sunday. September, when everything starts off again, we've lost a lot. We all feel it. We've lost a lot this year. We want to watch God restore what is lost. That's what he does. That's what we just sang about. And we're going to believe that he is going to begin the process of redeeming and restoring what's lost. Redemption Sunday, you'll hear a lot more about that. But in the meantime, just think, what have you lost? What would you like to see God restore for you? And then, of course, I sent a letter out. The, our, our denomination is sort of shifting everything around. Everything's going to change. We're sticking with the churches and the codas. We will have meetings about that, but I want to mention it so that you all know. You know, we're going to have a meeting so that you can be informed. And then the big thing, too, is that I'll be going on a sabbatical this summer. Uh, that's a, a break. So <laughs> I heard some clapping. Did I hear clapping? <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> I think I'm thankful for the clapping. <laughs> the idea is every seven or so years uh, in this profession, the a pastor is encouraged to take a couple of months off. So I'll be doing that. And I, if, if the last year hasn't been hard enough and I don't need it, I will after the next few months, right? So um, that's going to be good. So I just want to inform you of these things. This is what's going on in my life. This is where we're at. Um, and believing all along the way that God is restoring things. I just want to share those things with you because it's a lot. And, and I feel like I haven't had a chance to just... And some of it I haven't wanted to share publicly because it's not all my story, but... But that's how you, you know me, you can pray for me and my family and, and our body over the next several months as we move in new directions. I'm very excited about where we're going. Today, we are going to be talking about Revelation 17, 18, and 19. I'd highly encourage, the, the text will be on the screen, I think. Um, we're, we're having some technical stuff. But I'd highly encourage a device or a, one of these things. Some of you kids, this is what the Bible used to look like before it looked like this. But it looks like both. It doesn't matter. We're not picky. Um, although I personally, I do still do usually like paper. But that's because I'm over 20, I suppose. I don't know. Or is it 30 now? I don't know. <laughs> We're going to be in Revelation. I would encourage you having it in front of you because 
I'm going to be reading just a little talking, reading just a little talking. We're going to kind of stick with the text for, for a while today, so it might help to kind of be able to reference it. Um, so keep that in mind. Let me um, pray for us. God, would you work in our midst, among us, primarily as a community, as a people? Would you help us to be a, a group that, that loves and worships and serves you as well as, as individuals who do so. Would you use your word in us and among us today? It's in your name. Amen. All right, so like I said, here's what I'm going to do. A little, little bit different. I'm going to spend a lot of time with the actual text in front of us. We're going to read a little bit, talk a little bit. We're going to read a little bit, talk a little bit. And then we'll just make a couple of observations at the end. Um, so I'm going to start reading. Chapter 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. Now, Tony talked about this last week just to kind of orient us, the seven bowls of wrath. Tony did a great job, kind of addressed some of that. That's one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. Came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many Waters. Now, those waters, I want you to hold that in your mind. That feels like, what? Who's seated on waters? Remember, this is a revelation, it's visions, and there's a lot of dreamlike stuff, it's a metaphor. Those waters are going to be explained in a few minutes. So I just want you to remember it. But first, really important, big deal here, okay? I need you to, to know one thing. The last several chapters of Revelation, we're going to zoom out from this text for just a minute, and I'm going to point one thing out. We're not going to read this today. We'll read this probably next week. Chapter 21, verse 9 has an almost parallel verse to 17, 1. Okay? One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls right, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Okay? 17, 1 talks about a prostitute. 21.9, and seven angels, seven bowls, you know, the whole thing is a prostitute and a bride. And what we're seeing in the last several chapters, and we'll talk more about this, we'll talk plenty about this, is a comparison and a contrast, metaphorically, between two women, or as they'll come to be called, two cities, right? One we'll see, it pops right up, Babylon and Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's clear. So what we're, ha what we're seeing is a is a con contract, con contrasting between these two metaphorical women, cities, realities. Uh, I'm going to call it allegiances. So I just want to show you that that's the big picture. Now we're going to spend most of the time today talking about one of those, but we'll see there's a lot more emphasis later on the other. Uh, verse 2, whom the kings of the earth, speaking of this prophecy, have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of, those sec of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away into the spirit, into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Now some of this stuff will be very familiar if you've been here and you've been listening or you've read Revelation from a few chapters ago. There's this beast, but here's what I want you to notice. The beast is not in focus. John is not turning his lens on the beast, but on the woman. Because here he goes, sitting on the beast, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of a mystery, and we've seen that before. Foreheads, names, we've seen all that. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So he's focused on this woman and her issues, this woman being the prostitute, we will see, Babylon. When I saw her, this is, note this, I marveled greatly, John says. Remember that, so I'm going to mention it again. Why do you marvel or um, snap out of it? That's what the angel says here. John, <laughs> hey, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast with the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Now, I read that phrase. and I'm like, what is going on here? 
there's a few things. Was and is not and is about to rise. Now, first thing, the, the Lamb, the Lord Jesus in the book of Revelation has been called the one who was and is and is to come. And here this, this is being called the one who was and is not and is to come. And so there's a little bit of a parody, a little bit of a ha-ha, <laughs> right? That's a little bit of what's going on. You're not quite as good as you think you are, right? You want to be him, but you're not. That's actually happening here. But also what is happening is there's a rumor. In the Roman world, at this time that John wrote this, this is what people believed. Nero's not really dead. He's going to come back. Nero had been an emperor who, at the time John wrote this, was dead. But people said, no, 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 no. He's coming back. You watch. And for the Christians, see, some of us who know some of this history, we know, we think of Nero, ooh, he was a bad guy. But if you were a Roman citizen and not a Christian, Nero wasn't necessarily a bad guy, right? He brought power, influence. He returned, he restored some military might to the to the empire and they were some people were really hopeful that Nero would come back and so that's a little bit of a hint a little reference to he's not now but he will be but listen he will go to destruction it won't last yeah he'll come back but it won't last that's what John says and then the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel you hear that you see the beast what did john do when he saw it he marveled john john the disciple who in his own book in matthew mark luke john right he calls himself the disciple whom jesus loved now that might sound a little arrogant i know i think it's john's way of kind of moving himself away from the text but it's also confirmed in other places, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kind of right in a way that leads us to believe that Jesus was particularly close to John and a couple others. They were close. John was close to Jesus, closer, frankly, than I am, I believe. And he marveled at the beast, just like those whose names are not written in the book of life. So, so if, if, as we go, if you find yourself marveling or having marveled, Right? Um, know you're in good company. <laughs> it's okay. Give yourself a little grace if that's the case. Um, even John marvels. Why? At power, authority, glory, majesty, all the things that our hearts were made to marvel at. Because we have a creator who made us to marvel at all of those things. And Babylon, this woman and this beast, are a poor representation of what we're called to. Okay, this calls from mine, verse 9, with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, the Rome, in this era, was called the city of seven hills. If you don't think John is talking to his people, right? There are people who think, oh, John's just writing cryptic messages that only people at the time of the apocalypse will understand the city of seven mountains is clearly Rome. You know, the people that he heard it would have known he was talking about Rome. That's where the woman is seated. That's what he says. That's where she's seated. The power is seated in Rome at the time that he wrote. On which the woman is seated, there are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. It's not going to be long. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but belongs to the seven. What, what that means, that's a, he's talking about all the Roman emperors, but that's again a reference to that Nero belief. That the, the, the one of the seven is going to come back and be an eighth, right? It's, it's kind of a backwards, forwards thing. But it goes to destruction. That's the thing he's focused on. He says it over and over. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings, how long? For an hour. So what he's saying is, right now this power sits on the seven hills at Rome. There's more coming, but it's short-lived. It's short-lived for one hour. Time is short. Together, they, they serve together with the beast. 
These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. I just want to point this out, too. Uh, Tony did a great job last week, and he, he mentioned Megiddo. It was an actual place where a big battle actually took place, and it's representative Armageddon. That's where you get that word. Uh, he talked about some of that stuff. And the people sort of go to battle. But I just want to point out one thing. That verb, grammar geeks, okay, listen to me for a minute. That verb, see, we don't have this. In English, we conquer, I conquer, you conquer, right? It's the same word. In Greek, that's not the case. The verb changes depending on how many people and who are doing it. And that verb is singular. It very specifically means he will conquer. I think that's powerful. We don't do anything. The lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. This is language that had been used often. It had been used for Babylonian rulers. It had been used for Persian rulers. It had been used for Roman rulers. Lord of lords, king of kings, and we're talking about power. John is looking at at political, military, economic might. And he says, well, let me show you who the king of king is, the Lord of lords really is. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. We've got to ask that question, are we called, are we chosen, are we, are we faithful? That's the one we can most probably act on, are we faithful? The angel said to me, verse 15, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, remember that I said that, I told you, we read verse 1, remember those waters? What are those waters where this prostitute is seated? Peoples, multitudes, and nations, and languages. The power, the woman, the Babylon, the woman that we're talking about, is seated upon all the imagine in this world especially water travel is super important right tributaries and rivers and deltas you, know, you think about it, like the mississippi river branches out into the gulf and it kind of looks like that right you got all these little waters they all flow into one place in and out of the same of, of one source right the the peoples are that all flowing from eden all flowing out to a new heaven and a new earth, and on them all is seated a prostitute who holds power in the name of the beast. The ten horns you saw and the beast, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And that woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of earth. At the time, that was very true. That was Rome. Rome held political, military, and economic might over a lot of nations, a lot of the kings of the earth. It's not Rome now it's been through successive generations right historically there's always a military might a political and economic might in the world that exists as opposed to jerusalem babylon jerusalem augustine wrote this in his famous book 1500 years ago or so he wrote the the city of god and in it he contrasts the city of god what we call jerusalem with the city of man what here we call babylon these are two different allegiances alliances they're they're being compared you got the prostitute and the bride babylon jerusalem the city of man the city of god and what we see in, in verse 18 is she is ruling. But it looks forward, as we'll see, verse 2 coming up below is going to look forward to her destruction. That's what 18, 1 through 3 at least are reflecting on something different. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Having great authority in the earth was made bright with his glory. He called out in a mighty voice, listen, fallen. 
fallen. That city sits on all the waters, it controls all the people. Fallen. She's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. All nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and they've all committed immorality, and they've all grown fat, and it's over. It's over. And then he says he heard another voice. This is the voice, he has verse 4, this is the voice of God, not, not an angel. We haven't often heard, we have, but this is one of the only times in Revelation that we actually hear God's voice as opposed to voices of angels and other representatives. We know it's his because he's calling to his people. And he's calling to them, this is significant, how to live in Babylon, residents of Babylon, and citizens of Jerusalem. We belong to this city, but we actually find ourselves in this city. How do we then live? First thing he says, verse 4, come out of her. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Now, when I read that, how do we do that? I can't move from here to here. I can't do it. There's no moving company that's going to pack my house and take me to the new, the new Jerusalem, right? It's not going to happen. How do we do that? I thought of, you know, we hear it, and I've heard this before, you in, but not of, like this kind of language. What popped into my head was 2 Corinthians, where God is talking to his people. Paul is writing, but he's quoting God in the Old Testament. He, he's talking to his people, saying, we are the temple. We, we, this group, is a temple of the living God. He says, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. That sounds similar. Come out, go out. Be separate from them. Touch no unclean thing. How do we live that way? I will be a father to you. You should be sons and daughters to me. These are the, these are the things we get by separating ourselves. So there seems to be this separate. They like come out. Don't participate in the value systems of Babylon. Don't be a part of that. Come out from that. Have a different set of values and then he says another command so that's one command come out of her listen to the other verse five her sins are heaped high as heaven god has remember her iniquities pay her back as she herself is paid back repay her double for her deeds makes a double portion uh, as she has glorified herself in luxury so give her like measure of torment and warning you hear that they're all similar this command pay her back uh, repay means the same thing like measure of torment and mourning these, these sound like vengeance I, don't know. I mean it sounds like beating somebody on their head for what they've done what's the biblical command about that that's i struggle with this right because that seems contrary to what i've been taught romans 12 paul writes something that i think can help us wrap our heads around that though and and paul as much as John leans on themes that have been writing through Scripture the whole time, right? In fact, he's quoting Old Testament multiple times in this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. By doing so, this is a quote from, from Proverbs 25, by doing so, you're heaping burning coals on his head. It's almost like the way to um, the way to repay Babylon for her injustice is to love her. Jesus said similar things: turning the other cheek, giving someone your robe if they take your coat. I mean, very much similar to to Jesus's ethic. So, how then should Christians live in Babylon? Fighting. Arguing, trying to gain power, saying, Babylon is wrong, we must control it. Because isn't that one of the values of Babylon? Right? Power. We're just to love it, to serve it, and to pour <laughs> coals on its head. Wouldn't that be a more faithful way, I think, to, to carry out both biblical commands of of loving and repaying, right? 
because we're told that by loving, we can actually be doubling the, pouring the coals. That, maybe that's what we're called to do, is to love as opposed to control. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, it says. Now, we're going to see something that's really, I think, powerful. Starting in verse 9 of chapter 18, we'll see three different types of lament. Verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived their luxury with it will weep. And they say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon. For in a single hour, your judgment has come. And then in verse 18, we see the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her. Since no one buys their cargo anymore. Listen to this list. Cargo, this was being traded. This is economics. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, cloth, silk, scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves. That is human souls. The, the capstone, John is clearly the angel... Or, or the merchants of the earth, the people talking here, pointing out that the ultimate economic dependence of Babylon is willing to exploit even human souls in order to continue to gain wealth and power. And that that is the value of Babylon. And it doesn't care. It cares more about economics than it does humanity. Verse 14, uh, they go on, and they cry out, Alas, alas, the fruit for which our soul longs is gone from you. Uh, verse 16, alas, for the great city is closed, and, and it's all single hour, it's gone. And then the shipmasters, in verse 17, shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all those who trade is on the sea, they stood and they cried out, Alas, alas, verse 19, it's all over. Three types of people. One, uh, the kings who used the prostitute Babylon to gain their own power. And the merchants who used her to gain their own wealth. And the seafaring men who maybe were not a part of her, but they stood far off. And they used her anyway to make themselves wealthy. Wealth and power and luxury, these are the things and they're all for naught. And they weep, alas, alas. It's all gone. And then another command that God gives to his people in verse 20. Rejoice. Rejoice over her, O heaven. And you saints. By the way, some of us are like, well, yeah, this doesn't apply to me. Uh, that is another sermon for another day. But if you're here, and if you're hoping in Jesus, that word saint, that's you. It's not some special people. This is people that Jesus has put his hand on and said, mine. <laughs> That's a saint. Rejoice over her, you saints. For God has given you judgment against her. Tony talked about this last week and the harshness that we sometimes hear of that. It's God's judgment. Some of us know. Right? Some of us have experienced the pain that Babylon causes. In fact, I'd be willing to bet we all have. Some of us are just pretending we haven't. If you know the pain of Babylon, you'll have no problem with dancing on its ashes. None at all. And then it says the mighty angel took up a, a great millstone and threw it into the sea. Here's a theme that has run the gamut of Scripture. Okay, I just want to point out one quick place. Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah wrote a bunch of letters. The reason we see Jeremiah or Jerusalem and Babylon contrasted is this is the archetype. This is the, this is the people. The people were taken from Jerusalem in 500-something B.C. and moved to Babylon. And throughout the ages of Scripture, it's been Egypt, right? It's been Babylon, it's been Rome. It's been... I'll let you fill in the blank. Powerhouse. That won't last. And Jeremiah wrote 
letters to the people who belonged in Jerusalem but were happen happening to live in Babylon. And one of the things, this is one of the things he says in Jeremiah 51. You read this, you say, O oh Lord, I have said concerning this place that you will cut it off, Babylon, that nothing will dwell here. And say, and, and when you finish reading this, tie a stone and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates, that's the river by Babylon, and say, thus shall Babylon sink to rise no more. Millstone thrown into the water. This theme goes back. This longing to see the destruction of the enemy. Jesus picked that up too in Mark. When he said, it is better for, for someone, if you make a little one like this to sin, it's better for you to have a millstone thrown around your neck and thrown into the water. This is a theme of judgment that exists. Verse 22. <laughs> the sound of harpists, musicians, flute players, trumpeters, beauty, music, art will be heard in you no more. Craftsmen of many craft, of industry, of invention, of development, will be heard, found in you no more. And the sound of the mill of production and economic growth will be heard in you no more. All of these things, art, beauty, music, industry, invention, development, all of these things are the fulfillment of Genesis 2. The cultural mandate, we call it. God made humanity and said go and fill the earth and subdue it that doesn't mean just go have babies that means take the creativity that i've given you take the abilities that i've given you spread out invent make up all kinds of amazing things and spread it all over the face of the earth that was god's plan and babylon corrupted it babylon brought selfishness and pride and arrogance and greed and lust and all of that into the project of humanity doing what it was called to do so that all the things that we now build even churches are filled with sin it just is Babylon has corrupted the project of Eden but, and we will see this, Jerusalem aims to resurrect it. To restore it. To make it new and to redeem all of the things that we do with our hands. That because we're image bearers of God is beautiful, but because we're broken and sinful are incomplete. Jerusalem redeems and restores. I read this great quote on Twitter the other day. It was something along the lines of this. The plan of salvation is about you getting to heaven. The gospel is about joining God in his project of redemption of all that's broken. Which one of those things do you most want to be a part of? I don't think the plan of salvation is a grand enough vision it doesn't compel me forward. But joining God in the project of restoring, well, that's, that's something worth being committed to. He says, the light of the lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice, this is verse 23, the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more, because that's us. We're the the bride, the bride, Christ is the bridegroom, and now the voice of the bride and the bridegroom is heard in Babylon. We're doing it this morning. We sing songs. We, we, we seek to point people toward redemption, right? These are, this is the voice of the bride and the bridegroom. This is what we do. It's currently what we do, but one day that will be heard no more. That's what we're told here. And the merchants and the great ones and all nations were deceived and in her, in Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and all who have been slain on the earth. And that is, there it is again. This is another theme that runs from Genesis to Revelation. Well, you know what, what um, when Cain murdered Abel, that's in Genesis chapter 4, very first murder, one generation after humanity said, no, I got this, thanks God, I can handle this. One generation later he got murdered. Figures. Cain murdered Abel, and what does God say? He says, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. 
We see that theme echoed throughout Scripture. God is furious with that kind of injustice. Here we see the blood being found in Babylon, and God will not stand for it. There's some of us here, there may be some of us here, who are victimizers, warning. God's justice is swift and powerful. And there's some of us here who have been victimized. And I just want you to know that God's justice is swift and powerful. And that is such a wonderful promise, right? In fact, we see that in chapter 19. This is the answer. In, in 1820, God says, rejoice over her. And in 19, we see it. And I love it. 19 chapter, uh, verse 1. We see this in Revelation all the time. And we don't, let it, we don't let it simmer. I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. We read that, right? We read that. And we don't think about it. I want you to imagine, if you will, a professional football stadium. With every seat sold, in fact, they've got chairs on the field and butts in every chair. And I mean, people are just packed in there shoulder to shoulder from parking lot to parking lot. And they're just shouting together, what does that sound like? It'll tell us later, it sounds like many waters. You've been to a waterfall and you hear, you've got to yell to each other over the sound of the waterfall. It's this loud, roaring sound of many voices crying out together hallelujah salvation and glory and power all the things that we sometimes want no they belong to our god all the things that babylon would take and claim for herself no they belong to our god for his judgments are true and just they are he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Hallelujah, they say, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. I mean, it sounds dark, but it's not. Forever and ever, you can see her embers burning. (laughs) That is a hopeful thing to the writer and to this crowd of people gathered together that say, finally, finally, we no longer have to live in Babylon. And it goes on, they, they, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, they all fall down, they all worship, and then there's, there's the roar of many waters in verse 6. All these people who are celebrating that Babylon has finally fallen. You know what that reminds me of? Um, I went to a college called East Carolina University. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. It's way down south. Uh, but we had a big football rivalry. We were a football team. We, um, we, we had a football rivalry with NC State, North Carolina State. Um, it, it was a hot rivalry. It's kind of like the rivalry that might exist if, like, NDSU and UND both had football teams. But, uh, you know, but, but we did. Football was a big deal down south, right, for those schools. And, and, and what we would do, we, we ever, it was, I'll be honest, it was mostly East Carolina, my school, Every time we played, we'd tear down their field goal. Every time. And it was, if we won, it was like, ha-ha, we're tearing down your field goal. And if we lost, it was like, mm, we're tearing down your field goal. That's kind of the way it worked. I know. We were mess- Eventually, I think they had to move us to like a third-party place where no, you know, it wasn't at anybody's field anymore or something. But I think of that, right? I think what's happening here is the equivalent of like, we won, we're ripping down your field goals. There's this huge celebration excitement that's taking place massive i mean people would just flood the fields right it was it was a sight to behold if you if you ever been somewhere where you just see like all the stands empty out and everybody flood down onto the field that's kind of kind of gives you a feeling of what's happening here so that's a picture okay that's kind of what this is about so what do we do with this a few questions i want to ask you we've got this comparison again like i said we're going to look more deeply at the bride, the Jerusalem, in the coming weeks. But a few questions. Which of these are you most committed to? Which of these two kingdoms, which of these two cities, which of these two women do you love the most? Babylon's about wealth. We see it all over. Luxury, fine linens. uh, All about comfort, right? Power, trade, economic power, 
even involving slaves, exploitation, doesn't matter. I don't do whatever it takes, right, to get, to get mine. And about external appearances. Everything looks good on the outside. We got it all together. These are the values. This is the value system that Babylon holds on to. This is what, we, what Babylon loves. Jerusalem, which, by the way, literally means city of peace. Well, let's think about these things. Wealth. These are Jesus' words, not mine. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. I don't think wealth is quite valued the same way in Jerusalem. Um, power. Let's see, what did Jesus say? Blessed are those who win the culture war. Blessed are those who take up arms. Blessed are the, no wait, blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Runs counterintuitive, doesn't it? The meek will inherit the earth. Although, let's be honest, who's ripping down the goalposts in chapter 19? It's the meek. The ones that we would look at today and say, well, they're the losers. No, they're the ones ripping down the goalposts. External appearances. Are we trying to look good? Are we trying to come to church and be like, yeah, I got my life together? Or are we honest about our struggles and our failures and our weaknesses? Are we limping? Are we willing to limp together and acknowledge these things? I'll tell you the truth. I know I'm going on sabbatical this summer. I've, I've kind of half-joked with Jim and Troy that I don't want to come, come back and find my office packed up. And that's only half-joking. Now, I have no reason to believe that they would do such a thing or try to kick me out or any of that kind of stuff, but um, I'm, 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 I have feelings of, you know, I'm kind of insecure or... I'm not really good enough, and they'll probably find someone better while I'm gone. And, and all of these sort of things go on inside my soul. Now, I'm not proud of that, not yet. But, but that's what I feel like. I'm just trying to be honest. Now, I don't like that. I don't like sharing that. What do you have that you don't like sharing? Think about it and share it. Or pretend that you've got it all wrapped up. Which of these two cities and their values are you most committed to and which will you choose to live out what is your attitude toward babylon that's another question which of these are you committed to what's your attitude like the kings and the merchants and the traders are we using her for profit are we hiding our sin to protect ourselves are we hiding our insecurities our weaknesses or are we outwardly limping we're we like yeah this is what i struggle with i'm sorry I struggle with these things. Are we honest about our struggles? And are we willing to come out and align our values with the values of the bride? Here's an added, a question about your idea. Are you willing to accept her eventual demise? Babylon is going to burn. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Are you willing to accept that? And maybe more importantly, are we prepared to love her well right now? And how do we do that? How do we navigate that? Again, Jeremiah wrote all these letters to the people living in Babylon, and I find one of his in particular very helpful for me and us living in the days that we live in. It's in Jeremiah 29. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, and the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. There it is. This is the letter he wrote them. Verse 4 of 29, Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What's he say? How then shall you live? Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. There's a multi-generational project being looked at. Jeremiah's not saying make sure your 401k is set up so you can retire well. He's saying invest in at least three generations of people to live in Babylon. And verse 7, seek the welfare of the city where I've planted you. 
pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Love her. Serve her. He doesn't say try to make Babylon Jerusalem. He doesn't say try to make Babylon Jerusalem. He says serve her, love her, pray for her, live in her, and know that one day you will be leaving her. It's a very important attitude. Here's another one. What do you celebrate when you think about this? What do you celebrate the most? I love that image of the people ripping down the goalposts. And we're not there yet, okay? But every story that we tell ourselves drives our imagination. It hooks our hearts and it calls us to live a certain way, right? So here, here's my question. We think about celebrating and looking forward to celebrating. There are some of us present, I know this, and I know we all know somebody like this, right? All of us do, you have to, who, whose whole vision of the future and all of their hopes are driven by the possibility that the Vikings are going to win the Super Bowl. Right? We all know that. We're like, this could be the year. Now, I get it. I know I'm not a football guy, but sometimes I feel a little bit that way about the Cardinals baseball. I get it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not judging. I understand that feeling. I get it. But can you say, I am as excited about the possibility of Babylon's destruction and Jerusalem's victory as I am about the Vikings winning the Super Bowl? Right? Can, we, can we say that drives, that narrative, this story <laughs> drives our imagination and our life with it? Does it drive our excitement? Which of these two cities are you most committed to? What is your attitude toward Babylon? And, and what do you long, maybe as a good word, what do you long to celebrate the most? These are things, I think, that can help us evaluate our hearts and our imaginations as we live as residents of Babylon who are citizens of Jerusalem. Listen, here's the thing. I just, please, right here, okay? Just bear with me for just a minute more. <laughs> Babylon makes promises every day of life and hope and beauty and peace and love and wealth and power and just like all of the lying dying gods who roam her streets she then destroys everything she will let us down she will wound and injure us and many of us in fact probably all of us know what it feels like to be wounded and hurt and limping because we believed the lies that the prostitute told us. We've all done it. And you know what? We all keep going right back, don't we? Maybe this time she'll be faithful. Maybe this time she'll keep her promises. Maybe this time she doesn't. But the story doesn't end there. There is another city. There is another hope. And most importantly, there is a redeemer who restores all that is lost. Even all those things, right? All those lies that we believed Babylon would provide for us, he will. And the new city will. And as we will see, as that city comes into focus, he even goes so far as to eradicate all the sadness and all the mourning and all the loss and all the wounds that we got from living here and believing are lies. I'm begging us. Let's be a people whose hearts and imaginations and lives are bound up in believing the story told by Jerusalem and not believing the lies that Babylon tells us. Because she will fall, and she will reign forever. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we are citizens of Jerusalem. It is so hard to live in Babylon. Not because it's hard, but because, frankly, it's good. And her lies seem so easy to believe. Would you 
capture our hearts with visions of Jerusalem, of the new city. Help us to live well as exiles, to love the place where we're called to be even while we know she will not last. And set our hearts and our hopes and our visions for our futures on a new city. One where you reign and where all promises are kept. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.